The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Yes, good afternoon uh, or good morning, depending on what coast you're joining us from. For the folks that have joined us early today, we certainly appreciate that. We're a couple of minutes out from the start of today's session. Uh, before we get things kicked off, however, I would like to do a couple of quick house cleaning items. Number one, if the folks who are on the call right now, if uh, you can use your chat function, and throw through a quick chat that I am coming through loud and clear. We want to make sure the audio quality is really good. So if you could just uh, use your chat function and throw a quick, hey, we can hear you, that would be awesome. Okay, we appreciate that. I got a few confirmations over here that everybody can hear me, and that's that's great. Okay, so um, we are about uh, three minutes out from getting the session started. We have a lot of folks that are kind of in the queue still joining, uh, which is great. We've got some uh, good, uh, good interest in today's session, which I think everybody's going to really enjoy, digital data strategy for the lab. It's a great topic. Um, session today is going to go right around 60 minutes. What we'll try to do is come in slightly under that mark and leave a little bit of time uh, at the end of the session for Q&A. Now, we encourage everybody to ask questions as you're going through the session today. You'll simply type your question into the question panel and go to webinar. We won't stop and answer questions during the session, and when we get to the end, if we do have time, hopefully, to answer all the questions, or, or any of the questions for that matter, we won't read your name and we won't read your company out loud. All we do is we simply read the question out loud, and our, um, <clears throat> our speaker slash subject matter expert We'll do their best to answer that question. If we can't get the question answered, if we have a lot of questions and we don't get to your question, what we'll typically do is take all the questions offline, we'll package them up in kind of like a little document um, with the questions and the answers on there and send that out to everybody uh, who attended today. Okay. Uh, today's session is going to be recorded, so if you have folks in your organization that you think might benefit from this content, and that is usually the case, but they couldn't make it today, we will get a video sent over to you. Um, so that you can share that amongst your colleagues uh, in your organization. We will also send out a PDF copy of today's session uh, as well. That should all get packaged up and sent out, oh, I'd say usually within about 24 to 48 hours um, following uh, the session. So we're at a Thursday now, so I think probably by hopefully Monday or Tuesday at the latest next week we'll get everything uh, out the door. Uh, with that said, um, I think we're good to go. We're just going to basically take a brief pause, get the recording portion started, and come back on in about 60 seconds. So again, uh, we thank you for joining us early. Much appreciated there. And we will get started in just a moment. There'll be a brief pause. Hello and welcome to today's live webinar entitled Digital Data Strategy for the Lab, brought to you by the Asterix Technology Group, presented by Dave Dorsett. Uh, today's session uh, is being recorded live. Next slide, please. A little bit about today's session before we get into the content. Uh, today's topic is digital data strategy for the lab. We're going to talk today about the laboratory informatics systems that are often implemented um, and talk about this notion of a bottoms of transactional manner. So this is going to be things like the CDS, the LIMS, ELN, etc., cetera, um, <clears throat> and how they are brought in to deliver certain capabilities uh, to a laboratory. Uh, we're going to talk about these implementations and how they kind of tend to mount up. What are the implications of that? Uh, such as things like overlap among the systems uh, and obtaining kind of an end-to-end -end picture of the data from a scientific process. Uh, we're going to get into a discussion around, um, you know, kind of what are the significant business drivers that are pushing, putting pressure on laboratory and laboratory information systems, things like, you know, being able to handle um, a very diverse 
uh, set of drug products uh, meeting the increasing needs of the R&D organization. You have to be flexible, obviously, and responsive. Uh, how to improve the systematic management of product data and processes, which you know, you know means that you have to have data consistency and availability, and why these are so critical. Okay, so the webinar is going to basically address these challenges. Uh, it's going to hopefully kind of frame out what we think the current state is and talk about opportunities and approaches uh, for getting a, a holistic digital strategy for your laboratory. And uh, next slide, please. And joining us today, who's going to be presenting, is uh, Dave Dorsett. Uh, Dave is a principal software architect. Uh, Dave brings with us uh, over three decades of experience in R&D uh, informatics and lab informatics. So um, <clears throat> this spans, you know, global pharmaceutical, chemical, consumer goods industries. He's worked in a number of different industries, and he's got a really strong and extensive track record in, in doing things like architecting and designing and delivering um, both commercial as well as uh, in-house developed informatics solutions. So we're, we're thrilled to have Dave with us today. He's a great asset, uh, brings a ton of experience, and he's going to part some of that on you today. So Dave, if you want to introduce yourself, and I'll let you kind of take the wheel and, and take us through the presentation today. Sure. Thank you. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. And um, I think... Uh, you know, we kind of covered there basically the intent of the the intent of the webinar. So we're going to do this in a couple of session, sections. Um, hopefully, I would like to encourage you to uh, post questions um, a, as this goes on. Um, if we uh, if we have time at the end, as we said, we'll try to answer some of those. Otherwise, we will respond um, after the webinar. Um, but I would like, I really appreciate the opportunity to get feedback and questions on 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 these presentations and, and what people's interests actually are and, and follow-ups as well. So Sorry, I think I went on mute there. Okay, all right. Um, the uh, the definitions between a lot of the the uh, the systems on the left there um, are uh, have blurred over the years. Um, so you know where we have all of these uh, all of these variety of systems uh, from from variety from various vendors and such in our laboratories. We've kind of most of us have brought them in sort of one at a time. Um, again to meet specific needs and uh, and to uh, you know address address specific you know problems as they have come up basically in the life cycle in the life cycle of a company so again lots of lots of, lots and lots of different systems lines between the two um, everybody's familiar with the acronym basically the acronym soup <laughs> okay so today um, we're like I said we're not going to dive dive so much into these systems Specific. So this is not going to be a webinar about. Uh, that's going to cover like you know how do you know whether you need a LIMS uh, or an ELN or what makes a good one or what vendors do this or that or, or whatever or what are the characteristics. That's really not not what this is about here. So I'm sort of assuming that you have at least one several of the systems um, uh, in place. And today, what we're really going to be talking about is the ecosystem um, around these systems and the way that they actually work together. Um, so that's sort of what that's sort of what I'm mean what I intend when I talk about the overall digital uh, ecosystem or the digital strategy uh, um, around the lab systems themselves. So today, um, with these variety of different transactional systems that we've got um, in place now, um, the relationships in general between our systems are not, not very deep. Um, this is a general characterization of the state of affairs as I've seen it in many places. Um, it's not, you know, there are folks who have done, done quite a Bit of good work, you know, in this space. But in overall, uh, the relationships between those systems, uh, the ELNs and the CDSs and the LIMS and the SDMSs and all those things, are not what I would characterize as deep relationships. So we move data between them. We do forms of integrations. Um, we do we do basic stuff around you know, sort of validation of sample IDs and um, those types of things. But we don't really truthfully have, you know, adequate links uh, between the data between the actual systems that are responsible for the 
origination of the data and the usage of the data. Um, we have multiple sources of truth, um, you know, in the overall enterprise, you know, across all of these systems. We have um, a lot of tech transfer issues that are, and, and other quality issues that are the result of those types of things. And we do a lot of manual integration through entry and re-entry. Um, in some places, I've even seen entire organizational units um, basically created entire teams created to basically handle the integration between two systems in a, in a manual, obviously people intensive way. So this lack of an integrated workflow, um, you know, really is giving us no single picture of data from a decision making point of view. Um, our resources uh, that, we, that we use to execute, uh, you know, the, the important work, the important outcomes of the laboratory are generally over and under planned. Um, we have challenges in understanding the real time stack status of, of work um, in, the, in the laboratory. Um, the accuracy of that status is compromised by the fact that we do have so many overlapping systems um, speaking, to, speaking to the truth essentially in different ways. Overarching, you know, from an overarching point of view, again, sort of, sort of overly uh, simplifying a little bit, but, but a general characteristic is that we still do a lot of document-centric approaches. Um, we still, by and large, manage methods, for example, the document-centric approach. Um, you know, they, again, there are exceptions to this, certainly, um, but uh, but overall, but overall, you know, from the perspective of, of things that we would like to be able to reuse, things that we would like to be able to have fully digitized and have a digital transformation and have a digital handoff of, um, we still are very, very, very heavily reliant on document document-centric approaches. So the, um, you know, one of the basically sort of one of the outcomes of all this stuff is we, get, we fundamentally wind up with basically a very limited ability um, across organizations, across teams um, to digitally collaborate. Um, this, affects both, this affects both us inside the companies as well as our, with our external collaborations. So as we, as we work with external partners um, in any sense, any of the CXO models, whether it be CMO, CRO, um, out external synthesis, et cetera, um, with, the, with the state of information management and the state of these integrations and relationships between our systems, these external collaborations tend to be very labor intensive, um, not data driven, uh, not responsive, document driven um, by and large. So again, here's, here's an example of the kind of thing, kind of uh, situation I'm, I'm speaking to here. So here in representative sort of um, simplified example company um, has a CDS limbs, some form of a laboratory execution system and ELN and inventory SDMS and document management. So this is a rather, this is a company example of a company that's probably been around and executing, you know, late stage uh, work um, in the in the GLP GMP space for for a fair amount of time to have these types of systems. As you look across this system's landscape, um, it's pretty it's pretty straightforward to draw several different potential Venn diagrams sort of overlapping between these between these different systems and and have a legitimate set of questions about where the authority of information actually is. Um, so for the limbs to function, we obviously uh, configure test definitions and specifications as part of that. LES has a similar uh, conceptual overlap with the procedures that are actually defined there. We have templates in our ELN, and of course we have documents within the document management system that, that are overlapping with some of these as well. There's other overlaps. Um, the CDS would also overlap. I'm not trying to exhaustively go through and sort of point out all of the different ways that we can generate redundant data, um, just sort of illustrating here the type of thing that would naturally grow um, organically by the introduction of these systems in, into a company. Um, even with uh, good integrations between these systems, uh, the, def the needs of a test definition in the limbs and the needs of the test procedure specified in the LES oftentimes are such that they um, that they still necessitate a lot of duplication. Um, so the LES might need a different expression of exactly the same type of data that the limbs is going to going to also need uh, but they're for slightly different purposes so we wind up redundantly expressing um, a lot of this information so this is sort of an overview of some of the current state um, again across the ecosystem of the laboratory information systems uh, um, and this problem with authoritative data a lack of a deep lack of deep integrations lack of um, sort of building an, an overall digital understanding of the work processes 
So what I'm going to talk about now is an approach, um, not the only approach, but an approach uh, that uh, that I like to take when trying, trying to assess or examine um, the current state uh, of, of an ecosystem and the opportunities for how how that could actually be improved. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, and the development of what we'll what we'll call a roadmap, and I'll explain a little bit more about that as we as we get into this right now. So. Why a roadmap? Um, it's a word that gets used quite a bit. Um, in this particular context, um, I think of a roadmap from an IT ecosystem point of view um, in the same sort of way I would think about, like, if I was imagining, if I was going to take a year off and go to a completely unknown place, take a sabbatical, you know, what, how would I actually prepare for this for this type of, you know, substantial uh, journey? So I would, you know, I would basically develop a collection of maps and dictionaries and guides and and obviously just as we were discussing in the laboratory information uh, systems point of view there's overlaps between these things um, so the maps might give us a higher level picture of things but the guides are going to be redundant with respect to some of that multiple guides would certainly be redundant with each other um, same sort of overall overall thing but this set of information is going to give us an overall plan um, the plan that we're going to make though is, which is the characteristic of what actually makes this a road map as opposed to a project plan um, is that for a year-long trip to an unknown place we're not going to be able to predict all the possible decisions we're going to need to make over that year we're not going to be able to detail out um, in exacting you know sort of terms how long we're going to spend in each individual place what turns we're going to take as we drive down the road what trains we're going to be on what hotels we're going to stay out you know and obviously the further out in the future um, the less likely we're going to be able to have a an accurate um, plan um, we're just going to have to our plan is really going to need to be based on the bigger overall picture it's not going to be a project plan it's not going to be a step-by-step -step execution it's not going to tell us how much exactly how much everything is going to cost um, but what it is going to do is give us you know in accordance with our overall goals what things we want to see how much money we have to spend those types of things it's going to give us an overall structure um, that we're going to actually use to operate on a day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week basis. Um, and that's that, to me, is the significance of, of what makes a roadmap important when addressing the overall laboratory IT ecos ecosystem. This is not a project plan. It's a just... An, it's just an overall gist of where it is that we feel is important, where we're going to put our money, where we don't want to put our money, et cetera. So develop a roadmap um, you know just again sort of a relatively simplified view here but we're gonna break it down into four phases uh, and discuss these and then I'm going to go through, through a short uh, simplified example of uh, what's meant essentially within these different phases so um, first phase to develop a roadmap is a survey of your current state um, and uh, what we're going to try to also do while we're doing that is to capture our high-level future state needs at the same time a little bit more about this. Um, again, we're not trying to elucidate every possible, you know, every possible way every system is currently used, <laughs> nor are we trying to, nor are we trying to capture every possible uh, report, for example, that somebody might want out of the system in some future state. Um, this is an overarching survey um, uh, of the of the current state of how the scientists interact with the systems, all of the systems in the IT. And and what they're and what the gaps are in those interactions. And a little bit more about that to come. The second phase then is to take that data, that information that we've collected, then and organize it, um, organize that basically, organize both the current state and then future needs by artifacts. And again, I'll come back and explain exactly what I'm what I'm what I mean by that. There, uh, the third phase of an IT roadmap is to then take that organize information and begin to establish what I'm calling minimal viable groups of capabilities. Um, again, some more on that in an example to come. And then the fourth and final state is to basically assemble that information now uh, into the systems level uh, and develop an actual roadmap. Uh, now this process doesn't always cleanly break down into all four of these steps. Um, oftentimes you'll get into the third step when you're trying to bunch things into these minimal viable 
groups and you'll realize that you've got to go back and repeat some some things in step one and get your or with your organization essentially as part of step two wasn't wasn't as accurate as it needs to be or had questions to it so it's not strictly speaking a sequential do one do two do three do four it's it is more of an overarching um, iterative process but generally speaking these are the four phases um, that i see in in developing an it roadmap so current states survey. I spoke about this a little bit on the past slide. Um, again, what we're trying to capture here is the current state of laboratory practice. Okay? We're talking about materials, samples, and data. That's the focus of what the current state survey is, is on. So what we want to do is understand from the scientist perspective in their shoes, right? We, we need to understand what they do with their material with materials and samples and what they do with data. What data they generate, what data they they consume from other people, what data do they provide to other people and the same flows with materials and samples. It'll seem might seem a little strange in a in an IT roadmap to be having a discussion with scientists around materials and samples, but one of the characteristics of laboratory informatics is the importance of material and sample flow to the overall success or or gaps, if you will, within our within our overall states and within our overall ability to digitize and more effectively offer digital transformation and digital um, transfer of information across our organization, digital reuse of data. The material and sample is really what, what we're all about uh, from a pharma perspective or, or, you know, from a chemical process perspective, right? We, we're in business to make stuff. Um, and, you know, our data is all about the stuff that we made, how we made it, and what it is, and what effects and impacts it actually has. Um, but uh, ignoring, just focusing on the data itself and ignoring the material and sample flow, um, I've seen and experienced uh, in, in my career um, a number of latent issues that will build up over time uh, by doing that. So I really encourage that in this current state survey, we're spending a good amount of time understanding what what happens with in inbound sample materials, outbound sample materials, in and outbound materials as, as well. So really the exercise here is to think about this sort of in a way, you're going to come into the lab and we want to talk with the scientists and, and really kind of learn the organization. So think about it like, you know, talk, talking with the scientists, this is kind of like trying to give somebody a, a, an overview as a new member of your organization about exactly how things work in your labs. Um, and this is really truly best done on your feet in the lab uh, kind of a thing. There's a lot of other latent aspects of what happens in a laboratory and how people use the systems, how the scientists use our systems uh, that just does, will not come out in a conference room. <laughs> uh, so being in the lab, walking around, walking through the process is, is a way, one of the one of the techniques I'd like to use in order to increase the, improve the quality essentially of the information we're actually gathering. I'm not going to read through all these examples of questions, but these are the types of things things that we would prod scientists with during this survey. Um, you know, it's really, again, trying to get them to lay out exactly, you know, how the samples flow, how the material flows, how the data flows, how do they create data, who do they give it to, you know, um, do they believe that the people that are receiving their data are happy with it, so, um, you know, all, all, all these types of things. These are all example questions, like I said, mainly intended to prod uh, the scientists into sort of, you know, opening up about things that they do do every day, not necessarily with really thinking heavily about it, but things, but information we really need to capture from the business process and holistic kind of point of view. Now, part of this naturally, when you, when you, I mean, it's called a current state survey. It is sort of focused on the current state, but the natural um, drift of this conversation um, will be very much to get, will be very much to uh, exposing unmet and future needs. Uh, it's a very natural. Uh, for folks going through this kind of analysis about how they do what they do uh, to speak to, well, you know, I have to do this bit of housekeeping kind of stuff every week and it kind of drives me nuts. And, um, you know, when I get this sample information from these people, it's never, it's always not accurate. It would be really nice if, if I could rely on the sample manifest I'm actually getting, you know, from the, from the supplier here. So you will naturally, um, during the during this process of a current state survey, uh, be able to capture cr pretty critically important uh, unmet future needs around the 
business processes and the actual what's actually happening in the lab. Um, so we really don't, generally speaking, undertake sort of a separate formal future state survey. Um, it's really driven by the activities and the questions and the work in the in the current state. It's documented separately, but um, but that's basically sort of the overarching uh, process. So step two of this now we have a now we have a bunch of raw data. We have a whole bunch of uh, commentary around uh, uh, and and process flow kind of diagrams around material samples, data flow in the labs across different teams. Uh, depending on the scope of the assessment that we're talking about, it may be across any different teams. It may be just across one or two, or even just a single um, just a single part of the organization. But now we're going to try to organize that information into uh, artifacts and systems. So what we want to try to do here is characterize this, these material, well, materials and samples are pretty straightforward. They in themselves are, the, are artifacts, but the data itself we want to characterize into artifacts um, and eventually into systems. So here we're going to look at the use of things. So one, one way to categorize, categorize and understand the data flows is by how the data is actually, what the purpose of the data actually is. So purely operational data um, in our lab, that's, that's necessary to just make the lab run. Um, uh, we have data that's, that is uh, uh, related to regulatory compliance or regulatory reporting. Um, we have data that's used th at sort of um, directly or indirectly for high level decision making uh, or support of decision making. Um, we also generate data about the business processes itself. This is the type of data like, you know, the, the, so in, a, uh, in an analytical laboratory, in a testing laboratory, you know, what is the, the time, you know, the time between the uh, sample was received and the time that the results were actually produced. So this type of process data might be SLA kind of data uh, for analytical testing organizations. It also might be process data about how people make decisions in the branches and the work that they actually are doing in the lab. So this is one way to organize and categorize all that input that we've got around the current state. So by the type of use of data. Another way to categorize as it is by the scope of the use of data. So we have data that's really generated and used sort of in C2 by an individual scientist. So I'm standing here making a decision about what to do with this bioreactor. Um, and I'm generating data. I'm going to do a couple of analytical tests, look at viable cell density, do these kinds of things, and make a decision about whether or not to feed, the, you know, to add feed into the bioreactor. Um, that, that data is, is important in the overall scheme of things. Its immediate importance is obviously operational, making a lab run, making that decision, and it's really at a, almost at an individual scientist kind of level. It's really transactional in the sense of make it's being used to drive the immediate decision. We also have, categor we have a category of team data. So this is the type of data that sort of is summarized, aggregated, so that, uh, that bioreactor feeding information, for example, might be aggregated into a graph uh, that, you know, sort of lays out, you know, the whole feeding schedule for this reactor over a period of time. Time or during the entirety of the entirety of the process, that might be shared with the team or a larger, larger group for a functional data review. Um, and then we have like bigger level organizational data support for I listed this here support for big decisions. But another another use of organizational data, obviously, you know, regulatory compliance and filing data. So this is like this is the the capital D data, if you will, um, in terms of the importance of this to the to the end to the end work that we're to the the real uh, purpose of what we're doing. So this is one way to categorize and organize all that information about what people are doing with their data. Uh, just sort of tagging it and flagging it by, you know, how's it being used? Who's, you know, what level is the data is actually actually being being shared? Um, organizing into artifacts, um, you'll see this will come up in the example a little better. Um, what I'm speaking about here is is actually sort of organizing the data into, you know, what what uh, what specific data is this. This is, in, this is independent of the system itself, of the IT system. So we have sample data, for example, or we have data about a material. Um, we have, you know, data about a reactor process. Now that, that type of data, um, those would be sort of the nominal artifacts related to the data, the, 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 actual, the actual sample itself. Um, we, might, we might actually use, unfortunately, the reality is we might typically use multiple systems um, that all have some level of interest in sample data. But for the purposes of this organization of things, we want to know that, okay, this is the pool, this is the organization, all of 
this pool of information is sample data. So we're not organizing the current state uh, with respect to the actual software systems that are in place now. now we're not going to make notes in here about what is put in Excel versus what is put in a database versus what is put in a, uh, a COTS vendors, you know, ELNs system. Uh, we're really just trying to get at the core uh, artifacts and the core types of information that we're managing. Because our goal of all of this is to get an understanding of that data flow, right? That's what we're really trying to focus our, ourselves on here. That's what we want to, that's what we want to make more efficient. That's what we want to understand where the brittleness is in that, in that data management process. You know, if the company is trying to scale up um, in terms of the amount of work that's being done, those types of things, that, that type of understanding is really what we're trying to get to. Um, so we're not basing this on the systems. We're looking at the creation, the use, the augmentation, and hopefully maybe the, the endpoint lifecycle of of this data um, in, the, in the labs as it flows from team to team. Um, there could be some other important factors that come out during these discussions, depending on the, you know, depending on the company itself and what they're doing and all, all sorts of other things. Um, you, might, you might take note of things that are related to governance of data. So when multiple teams have to agree um, on a certain type of data, there can be very implicit governance, which is, you know, my, would be, um, you know, they, there's obviously trust in the organization between those two teams, but, you know, they might, two, two different teams might sign two different sample ident identifiers uh, to information. And they're both aware of that. They both know that. Um, and they just kind of tacitly let that be. Um, uh, so governance really speaks to sort of the cross-cutting uh, data processes and how and how those are actually handled mostly organizationally. Uh, data quality um, is another thing that will come out in this. So you tend to get a lot of comments from folks about, you know, the, the times they have to go back and reprocess data or redo data because of, you know, because of mistakes in what they were sent or mistakes of transcription or those types of things. Um, another important factor that will come out sort of in this current state survey, current and future state survey, is the, the collaborative data. So, um, so where they are working with external partners um, of any form, receiving data, essentially from those partners, uh, sending materials or samples out to other partners to receive data back. Um, in some interesting discussions or one common uh, topic that actually comes up is about repatriation of data. So nobody should assume that a partnership is forever, um, you know, in, in this sense that, uh, you know, if you're working with a, C with a CRO in, in some type some type of activity as you're returning, as you're providing samples to them, getting back, uh, testing information, um, you know, there's, there's a question about how much data essentially are you actually getting back? Do you want to get all of it back or are you just interested in, in sort of the, uh, the higher level reports? So collaborative um, aspects uh, come out in the current, current future state summaries. Um, questions about repatriation also, also tend to come out. So now we've got basically a set of capabilities organized around these artifacts and organized around how they're actually used. Um, we've Sort of merged all of the current and future state into that. And now the exercise turns to how do we actually group these um, into things that will become actionable. Um, that's the purpose of this particular exercise. So here um, I'm, going to, I'm using a term called minimum, what I call minimal viable groups of capabilities. Um, so this is this is a spin-off of a term that many of you may have heard that uh, typically is used in the software development industry called a minimal viable product. Um, and the idea behind a minimum viable product is if you have the if you have an idea for something new a new software application a new app um, then uh, you know what one way to test that out the best way to test that out uh, in terms of best practices is to build the minimal viable thing that'll let a particular user run your app try your app and give you feedback so if you can create a minimally viable set that's a, that's basically a minimal investment in creating a skeleton application that show will demonstrate to the user what problem moment is that you're trying to solve and how you're actually trying to solve it, then you can very quickly get feedback on that, like I say, with a minimal investment to determine whether or not the, the, uh, the application actually makes sense. That's the notion of a minimal viable product uh, in the software development space. Um, we're going to apply that here, not to a pro product per se, but to these capabilities. So we're going to group these capabilities now into these minimally viable groups. Um, so we're going to take some, we're going to take our common 
Secretary about the current state of sample management, um, accessioning and identification. And we're going to group look at that across the organization about how different people are doing that and how and how people are transferring that information to each other. And we're going to maybe draw a little draw a di draw a circle around that piece. Of thing and call there's a minimal viable group there's a minimal viable set of capabilities that we need for sample identification um, it's not we're not going to put everything that you possibly want to have in a sample tracking system um, you know in that group we're going to sort of break this down into these minimally viable uh, chunks um, and we're doing we're going to do this because we're going to we don't definitely want to avoid trying to meet all of the needs that are going to come out from these assessments in some magic single jump um, that's a recipe for a that's a recipe for a failed IT project in general um, and one of the reasons it is this is not just because of the size and scope typically of what you're talking about there it's because that during that time that you del deliver that those needs will change by delivering any chunk of capabilities the needs change um, so this is kind of like a Heisenberg principle of, of software development here so we influence the lab by delivering new capability. So predicting where the lab is going to be after we've delivered several new chunks of things is, is a very, it's basically, in my opinion, an impossible exercise. Nobody has a crystal ball that can do that. So if we can break these capabilities up and get them prioritized in this minimally viable way, then we can, we can actually use the perturbation that delivering that actually creates to make sure that we're reassessing ourselves and staying on the right roadmap. This goes back to some of that conversation before about why this is a roadmap and not a project plan. So if we figure out some minimal set of things that are actually needed in sample identification and deliver that to the organization, the work processes are gonna change, presuming we're successful. The work processes will change. That means the needs will change, priorities will shift. We're gonna need to do a little reassessment around that space in order to understand, is it now more important that we move on with a more robust, full-blown sample tracking and provenance uh, capability, sample custodial reports, all those kinds of things, or has this now shifted around in such a way that, that there are other business processes that are more important uh, to implement across our systems? Um, I, I pretty much already spoken this, but one important considerations when you're actually doing this is to focus on capabilities, not features. We're not trying to solution here. Um, we're not writing a, we're not so much writing uh, what would be sort of very, specific testable product requirements um, but we're focusing on a deliverable capability in the business in the laboratory workflow we're going to be looking for common themes here so we're going to try to pull together things that are coming out from different parts of the organization or coming out in different parts of these discussions uh, that we've had and I already talked to you know, a fair amount about considering the impact of change while you're defining minimal um, that is a you know that that is one of the one of the key elements of this so now we've got these minimal, now we've got the set basically of minimal viable capabilities. Now from those groups, we're going to basically attempt to assemble um, a guide book, a roadmap. So now at this, this point, this becomes more related to the existing internal, existing IT systems. Um, so across those capabilities, we can evaluate the relationships to the existing systems. So if we already have a sample inventory, if we already have an inventory system in place, but we've identified needs for consistent sample identification then you know we have a we have a relationship to an existing system that we can take advantage of um, is that so as we're assembling these capabilities into roadmaps um, you know with form with business and scientific priority uh, we can evaluate the relationships between those capabilities to existing systems we say well this will be an extension to the existing inventory system or this will be an integration between these two systems those are the types of the types of uh, 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 solutioning breakdowns. This is a bit of solutioning now. Um, we're going to need to elaborate dependencies. So we can't really build a, um, a comprehensive, um, you know, custodial sample sample management with custodial reporting uh, if we don't have integrated sample tracking. Um, so, you know, you can't generate a report on something you don't have in any of your systems. That's an obvious dependency. <laughs> um, so those are the types of things that we're also going to have to be cognizant of here as we as we assemble this roadmap um, we're also going to we're also at this stage going to sort of size these things and and sizing here 
or I like to try to use the sort of the agile approach of t-shirt sizing. Um, so this is a small thing. This is a small capability group in terms of implementation. This is medium, large, extra large, extra, extra large, maybe. Um, so we're not trying to, we're not trying to uh, put a number of hours on this. We're just trying to put relative size and relative technical risk um, assessments on this as well. So, you know, some things will be small in size, but might have high technical risk. Um, so we want to keep these char those characteristics actually separate from each other. Um, and here we are talking about, we are talking about technical risk. Um, and, you know, before on the early this slide I mentioned um, assessing the organizational change management aspects of risk. And that'll come up again in just a moment. Uh, that's a different type of risk. So here in this assembly, we we're specifically talking about technical risk. Um, this, is, this assembly now basically is not going to be, uh, there's not going to be a single path. <laughs> um, you're going to get a set of potential paths. You're basically going to get a network um, of relationships between capabilities. Uh, and, and so the next the next part of this then would be to, you know, evaluating that, um, you know, particularly using these criteria of size and risk uh, and dependencies uh, will sort of bring to light um, typically multiple paths. Um, it's typically not that it falls out and there's just like one magic answer uh, about how to get from point A to point B. Um, and you actually want a couple of different paths um, for the same reasons that we were, that I was discussing when we were um, back on the slide about why this is a roadmap. Um, you, hopefully you'll get clear guidance on where you're gonna be starting, <laughs> uh, what, the, what the near term types of things will be, but then things are gonna need to open up um, after that. You're going to want things in, to open up so you can reassess this, um, reassess your path uh, to deliver the biggest benefit uh, with the smallest investments. You know, you want to, at the end of the day, you know, this becomes cost benefit uh, in terms of how you're going to traverse the traverse the roadmap. Okay, a couple of quick notes on do's and don'ts, sort of in the roadmap assembly side of things. Um, I think we touched on many of these already. So we do want to have multiple approaches. We do want to have some. Um, some documentation essentially available to us uh, in, in the form of the way our artifacts are organized and our risks are characterized and things like that with what the trade-off is actually are going to be. We, we do, we very much want to make sure that we're describing a real world deliverable system. And, and sometimes this means that in the interviewing process, you're going to get, um, you're going to receive data that you're going to need to, I don't know, tone down or weight down. <laughs> um, you know, we we want to we want eighty percent. Most of the time, scientists are very practical about what their actual needs are. It doesn't doesn't happen very often, but every once in a while, you know, something will come up where it's just you know the the um, the real world or the practical deliverable aspects of like meeting that particular requirement just don't make sense. Um, so we do want to make sure we're focusing here on real world deliverable things. I already spoke about risks. Um, I didn't speak about mitigations. Um, part of the the documentation of the of the ultimate roadmap might be not necessarily for all of the risks that that are characterized, but for the larger risks, you might uh, make notes about about how you know initial thoughts about how the, how those risks might be mitigated. Um, that could introduce feedback actually into the whole process of assembling and organizing these minimum viable groups of capabilities. If there's something that comes out with a very large risk, and particularly if something comes out with a very large risk and a very large size. Uh, that's a key indicator that you, you need to step back and try to be creative about how you might break that apart um, into either the pieces that are not so big in size or a couple of pieces that split the risk up. Um, we do want to incorporate potential for organizational disruption um, in this. We're, we're going to do that. We're not planning five years of, of future projects all at once. That's one, one part of it. But in your organization of capabilities, it's also important to consider this. Um, as you introduce new capabilities into the lab, people are going to have to be trained. People are going to have to learn how to use it, how to incorporate it into their daily life, all those types of things. That's organizational disruption. Um, you want to be sensitive to too much disruption. You don't want to constantly be, be pounding people with learning new stuff. Um, there, there is a, um, I've seen many times actually, um, particularly longer term uh, programs, um, a weariness. Uh, you actually get the, the scientists, the user base becomes change weary. Uh, they're just beaten up with too many releases. And, and so 
you know, despite the fact that more often than not, we in IT are, are never fast enough, um, it does over a period of time, <laughs> constantly deliver over a period of time, you know, introduces a significant amount of uncertainty into how people are going to do their job day to day, and that that's a very disruptive um, disruptive activity. Um, I spoke a little bit about how you build that roadmap about making and reviewing the directional decisions. You know, as that path between the different capability groups actually sort of lights up, um, you know, you're going to you're going to be able to make hopefully some document you know some documented notes there about um, you know consideration for whether or not you go left or right basically at, at this point having having reached the having delivered upon previous groups of capabilities uh, um, again a little bit we'll get a little bit repetitive some of the early slides but don't be per, don't be fully prescriptive um, you can't see the future nobody knows the future You'd be lucky if you can you're, you're you're good if you can predict 18 months or even 12 <laughs> uh, depending on the organization uh, and the maturity of the organization and those types of things of course but um, you don't want to be fully prescriptive in, in this. The point of this is not in, you know, every step that's going to need to be taken for the next five years, every single project that needs to be executed for the next three years is not what I would consider a practical outcome of a roadmap exercise. Um, on the other hand, you don't want to be completely non-prescriptive. You don't want to just sort of make slideware, right? You don't want to, you don't want to like overly not, not add any significantly meaningful value. This needs to be based on what you are going to is really doing now, what the gaps and the critical needs of that organization really are, and focused around that, not on the theoretical, well, we have to have an SDMS because we just don't have one. That's not, that to me, there's no, you, you need to be able to justify those kinds of things back to the business process. You need to be able to justify it back to those capability, back to those missing capabilities in the gap analysis. Don't ignore implementation. Um, we're to build something that's a little bit of overlap with the one thing on the do side of things and and the other don't is don't create this in an IT vacuum so you know you, you have to be sensitive of course to scientists time and, and all that but you really want to make sure that you're engaging them through this process the you know the, one of the better outcomes here a good a good outcome measure is um, the level to which uh, the entire group of people that have been involved at the early stage in, in, in describing the work processes and all that, the level of which they actually understand that whole roadmap picture. If you're doing this for multiple teams and multiple parts of an organization, what you're really trying to do is build a shared understanding amongst some group of leaders, you know, in the sign on the scientist side of things for why the overall IT, you know, landscape, if you will, needs to change this way. Not everything every team wants is going to be highest priority, but you want to use this opportunity, this this type of assessment and roadmap generating exercise as a way to build that understanding. You can use it, and it's a good idea to try to use it to build that understanding amongst that group of people. So they all see where their needs are, but they all understand what the bigger picture actually is as well. So don't do this in an IT vacuum. You know, keep keep the scientists, uh, scientific leadership, et cetera, engaged. All right. <clears throat> so that's the theory part of all this. Um, I have a very simplified high-level example. It's it's tough to put an example together just because these are also very, very specific to, you know, the individual company and what stage they're in and their particular set of history and, I mean, all of those kinds of things. But I tried to assemble here a little bit of an example of those four, of these four steps and exactly what I'm talking about. So we're going to, we're going to play a sort of a what if game here. So we have a, we have a role relatively small group of folks doing protein synthesis and analysis. Um, so, you know, mostly they're working together by email today. Um, each group has their own sort of labeling.
is an obvious artifact. So we have a couple different kinds of material we're dealing with here. We have a lot of uh, uh, proteins being produced. So we have a, its identity, which may, you know, which is basically sort of at what time and who did it and what the definition of that is, a recipe. Um, we have sample oriented artifacts, the time a sample was drawn, the container it's been put in, or if it's been split across containers, how it was stored. These are examples. This is obviously not comprehensive um, of either the artifacts or the kinds of properties, but these are sort of some of the high level artifacts that come out of this, uh, would come out of this type of uh, current state. Um, on the experiment side of things, we have tests. So those tests have definitions, they have methods, conditions, they have the sample that was actually test. They, you know, there's a bunch of files uh, from the analytical instrumentation. Um, and then there are results or conclusions um, at this. So the testing team, when they run experiments, these are the types of, they produce an artifact, which is a test, which has these types of properties. Um, we have files as well, um, and those files themselves are artifacts. They generally have, there's might be associated with an instrument and a timestamp. Um, obviously here I didn't produce, I didn't, I, like I said before, this is not a comprehensive list of artifacts. You know, we'd have an experiment that was uh, related to the actual bioreactor itself with, with sort of similar things. Um, and we have another important artifact that, you know, in, in this groups, in these two groups process, which is the report itself. So it's authors, it's got authors, author, authors uh, associated with it. It's got references to experiments. It, it describes this particular type of scope. It may describe a particular material, a protein via the experiments, um, or it may be explicit. Um, so it may be, you know, maybe a report uh, that, that summarizes a particular set of experiments. It may be a report that is higher level in essence about a particular higher level material. So this is an example of the artifacts uh, that would come out of this analysis. So non, again, this is not a comprehensive list, but now we start breaking those down into capability groups. We've got identities. So we have a bunch of capabilities related to things that we need to be able to identify or label or name. So we need to be able to do that with a material, a lot, a sample, a test. We have a bunch of identity uh, problems. We have provenance uh, around lots and samples. So who did it? When were they done? You know, where do I find out more information about it? You know, where might I get more char more characteristics um, about specific characteristics about that that um, that lot or that sample? We have experiments, experiment related capabilities. So we have a bunch of core metadata around scientist tests, links links to things, and then. We might have a future capability group around, you know, how might we within this particular type of experiment, a test experiment, standardize those result tables. So, but as the core, you know, minimal viable group, minimal viable group of capabilities for our experiments would be to identify this experiment actually happened, who, who did it, when it was done, you know, some link to the files itself that are that represent its raw data, some link to its results, even if those things are not structured. That's a minimally viable group of capability. Um, I'll skip report for the moment. Um, for data files, you know, we want we would want to have um, a, minim, a minimal set of capabilities where we would be able to have a reference to a data file. So we want to know who did it, when, and a reference to it that was permanent, that didn't rely upon directory naming structures and the fact that somebody could move a file accidentally, even from one point to another. We just want to have a we need a minimal capability around data file management here that everybody could share. So no matter when or who did the work, if there was an instrument data file or a data file with the bioreactor data in it, uh, we could reference it, we could all find it, get, get a home goal on it. We might want to extend that capability with additional metadata around that data file. Um, but the first minimal viable set of data file capabilities would be like that first, the first number there. Um, and then we could add, add extensions to that over time. So the sub numbers here are within each of these sort of domains, sort of the idea of the minimal groups, right, the, of things. So how we might actually sort of batch things into relatively small steps. Um, some of these steps are bigger than others, um, but they're relatively small, consistent steps that can be used to sort of uh, build uh, build up our build and expand and capability for this group. So here's how we might actually sort of um, ex you know tie these things together. So we might we might build ourselves or or, 
or install bring your COTS product on board um, that gives us the basic ability to define a material a lot or a sample and gives us what's called a pearl, a permanent URL. So that's just an identity that we can always rely upon. Um, for, so once we define a sample, uh, whenever we need to refer, whoever needs to refer to the sample, they have an identity, an identifier, um, you know, that they can use, that they can embed anywhere they want, um, and wherever they embed it in whatever reports or whatever they, whatever system they actually want to put it into, it always points to the same thing. So we might, so we might actually start with a process that 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 does that, you know, first up. Um, we want to move on uh, to a data file storage capability along that minimal group I was talking about before. So we can just have files, not so much, they might still live in directory systems ultimately somewhere, but we need to have a way to have referenceable files, uh, shareable files uh, with each other. Um, we need a way to register our tests. Um, so we might we might propose that basically as a as a third capability. We want a repository for these documents and reports, and that might be built as an extension to um, to the data file storage itself. Documents and reports are our type of data file, um, but you know as a capability, it would be viewed as something different. The data file storage is more about raw data, instrument data. The repository for document reports is clearly about processed uh, information. So the sharing ultimately the sharing. You know, the abilities to share files out of those things might there might be different um, might be different um, functional requirements in those two. Hey, uh, David, uh, I just wanted to give you a five minute warning. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Well, this is the last slide, so it's perfect timing. <laughs> so, so then we might actually sort of expand upon our registry system and 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 capture more information and provide some searching capabilities and additional more structured data. So this is the and, and so on. Again, this is not a comprehensive example. It's very much a manufactured um, a manufactured example. Um, you're going to wind up probably uh, if you do this and you really are focused on breaking down these things into minimal viable capabilities, you could wind up with quite a long list of, uh, of steps. Um, on a practical basis now, when you go to assemble them into projects uh, for execution and, and sort of elucidation of full functional requirements and all that, then you may, you know, you may be combining things. Um, but what we're trying to do here is have that holistic look at all across all the laboratory informatics systems and all the processes in the lab so that we're less focused on building out you know, pre-solutioning essentially, adding this feature to our limbs, adding that that um, uh, column of metadata to our CDS project folder. You know, you know, it's less about you know, sort of the head down tactical, do that, do this, do this, but in trying to give ourselves a, a higher view, a, a bigger sense of what the business processes actually are, what's going to be impactful to them, how do we fill the gaps? Um, and not so much taking it from a systems point of view, but actually looking at it from a process point of view. Okay, so that was um, that was basically the material I wanted to present today, and some thoughts about how what is sort of a you know a holistic what. What is a holistic data strategy for them? Um, Non-system focused, uh, business process focused, scientist data material flow focused, sample flow and data flow focused. Um, how to sort of assess that, uh, you know, via the construction of these roadmaps and then a, and then a short and very simplified example.